And Shenouda claims that there was thousands of Nubians, Blemies, and uh, Nobodians who had taken shelter in his monastery, and many of them actually got saved. So this is the first recorded mass conversion of black African people in church history, was in the fifth century, and it was through an African connection between Egyptian monks and Nubian refugees. Well, hello and welcome to the Well After Hours. I'm your host, Beverly Allen. And on our show today, my guest is no stranger to the well. He has been here several times in the past. And each time that he comes, he brings and shares some exciting news uh, for the whole Christian community at large, to Christian academia and to the Black church. He is not only uh, the Oheni or president, of the Meacham School of Hymenot, which in St. Louis, which is a fully accredited seminary offering PhD programs. But Dr. Bantu himself also has a doctorate uh, focusing on early African and Asian Christianity. He is also the assistant professor of church history and black church studies at Fuller Theological Seminary. And he is the host of the Bizrot which is African apologet uh, Apologetics in African Terms podcast, which is a ministry of the Jude 3 Project, whose founder and president is Lisa Fields. He is the author of several scholarly works, one of which brings him back to the well today. And I want to welcome my very special guest, Dr. Vince Bantu. Dr. Bantu, thank you so much for coming back to the well. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Sister Beverly. It's great to be back. <laughs> and and you know what? I here we have two. I have to mention these two because we're leading up to the latest one. You did um a multitude when you were here, a multitude of peoples, of all peoples, engaging ancient Christianity's global identity. And you have the gospel hymenote, a constructive theology and critical reflection on African and diasporic Christianity. And now today we are here to discuss this phenomenal book, Those for Whom the Lamb Shines, The Making of Egypt Egyptian Ethnic Identity in Late Antiquity. Dr. Bantu, I tell you, you have, you have done so much. And it seems like in a short period of time with these writings, these scholarly works, I, I, I don't even know how you did it. You know, you must have been working on maybe several at a time at the same time. Is that possible? <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's that is how it goes. Because even as we speak, I'm working on about four more at the same time right now. So uh, yeah, <laughs> that's kind of oh. how it usually goes. Got different pots on the stove, or whatever the analogy is, uh, but different irons in the fire at the same time. Wow, I tell you, well, I I I I want to certainly respect your time, and um, I want to get to some of the questions, but. Could you just tell the viewers something quickly about yourself, something personal, real quick, and I'll and I'll get into my questions. <laughs> oh, oh, absolutely. Uh, well, yeah. Uh, as as you mentioned, uh, I, I reside here in, in St. Louis, Missouri, and uh, we're with my wife Diana and our two daughters, Taina and Naniki, uh, and we, uh, uh, you know, I do teaching and, and writing and speaking, uh, you know, on this in this area of early African Christianity. And my wife and I also pastor a small church uh, here in st louis but my wife is actually from new jersey where you know where i know you're from sister <laughs> beverly so we uh we have a uh uh we have a very diverse family uh we we love traveling with and we love pizza so in st louis we have our own kind of pizza that's unique to here it's like we we say we invented thin crust pizza these little bitty squares and then she's from new jersey we get them big old slices that you got to fold in half and she always you know so we we love both kinds of pizza and we we introduce our kids to the to all of their different roots and their different regions they're from uh as we travel and teach them about the, the different places that they're from but also just we love traveling around the world and and seeing uh, God's creation and, and God's people. Well, I tell you, that is amazing. And, you know, as I talk about 
this your your newest book. Um, I wanted to ask you, how did you come to the title to settle on the title for this book? Those for whom the lamb shines. Yeah, yeah, that you know that that's a great question because um the the title is actually taken out of a primary text that one of which I engage in the in the book uh, because the book is about Egyptian identity, uh, Christian identity, and also like kind of religious and ethnic identity. And there's a quote from a sixth century theologian uh, named Severus of Antioch that I engage in the book where he actually said that Egyptians feel that they are the, those for whom the lamp shines, as in like God's lamp shines only for them. And he was making a reference to his perception of their tendency because he Severus was actually uh, he was the leader of the Church of Syria, but he was exiled by the Roman Empire because of both the Syrian and the Egyptian rejection of European theology. And he was living in exile in Egypt and he was mixing it up with the Egyptians. And they both had the same experience of being minorities within kind of the early church uh, in Europe. But yet they still had some differences. And he was making that statement that Egyptians feel that they're those for whom the lamp shines and he was speaking kind of of their sense of being kind of a unique culture that's different even from other communities like his with whom they actually shared same theology so uh it was kind of like an entry point into the book the really the subject matter of the whole book which you know again is you know kind of the emerging sense of Egyptian ethnicity, especially after the major split in the church in the in the 400s in the fifth century. Um, but it also kind of gets into even going, you know, it goes back to even when I first got into studying early African Christianity, especially in Egypt was my first context of really studying early Coptic Christianity. And it made me I, from the beginning, I when I first heard that Christianity was in Africa and it was in Asia uh, early, you know, and it never stopped. It didn't go away. I became really interested in wanting to learn more about that history that really is kept from us in uh, in many parts of the world. And one of the questions I had was, well, how is it distinct or how is it unique? In, in how is it different from the Western Christianity that we have encountered? And and this was actually one of the first um and one of the biggest examples of of that uh, of an answer to that question of how it was different uh was you know kind of the the split that happened in the 400s and the christology that was unique uh in Egypt and in other uh parts of the world and so that title and really the whole nature of this book really gets at probably one of the biggest differences or one of the biggest ways that that the Egyptian church is different uh from the western church or we could even say how the western church is different than the Egyptian church. Wow. I tell you, um, you thinking about this, you as a Christian historian, having done several scholarly works already, where does this book fit in? I mean, like, you know, is it in the middle of them? Is it at the end of them? Or is this just a completion of what you've done, you know, like before? <clears throat> yeah. It, it, it really, uh, it really kind of is a mixture of, I mean, there, there's a lot of the similar themes in this book that I touch on in a multitude of all peoples, which, you know, was really written for, uh, it's, it's kind of like a, a hybrid book, uh, that's, academic and gospel hymen are also that they are theological works, but they're also written for a broader audience as well. At the same time, kind of to bridge the, the popular audience and the academic audience. Mm -hmm. And, I talk about a lot of the same issues, especially the the schism, the or the big split that happened in the church in the in the year four hundreds, and the effect that that had on the early church in Africa. But this book, those from lampshines, it really goes in a lot more depth into that topic that I touch on in Multitude of All Peoples, uh, not really in Gospel Hymenal, but in Multitude of All Peoples, I touch on this, uh, you know, Chalcedonian schism uh, at the Council of Chalcedon in 451. And this book really goes into more depths with it. Um, and uh, and so I think in that way, it kind of, uh, it, it goes into more depth. And it's in, so in that sense, you could say it's kind of in the middle of the uh, Multitude of All Peoples book. Can you tell, can you talk a little bit about, um, how the shaping of Egyptian identity and its importance to Christian history, to church history. 
Yeah, yeah. I, well, I think, uh, you know, this is uh, something that I talk a little bit about in Multitude of All Peoples and then again, get in more deep, uh, in more depths in this book. And I think that it's really important when we look at the fact that that the this book delves into the the schism or the split that happened between kind of the church of the dominant European continent or the dominant Roman Empire in 451 and the church of Egypt in particular. Uh, and kind of from that point in 451 up until the Islamic conquest. And what we really see when we look at that is the way that the Egyptian church had its own theology, its own doctrine. And there, the, the Christology was distinct in that Egypt was arguing that Jesus was one person and one nature. And the dominant position that came out of Constantinople and Rome and what we now call Europe was saying that Jesus was one person, but two natures. And that, that was really the theology that pro even after Protestants, uh, you know, split from the Catholic Church in Europe, that was still something that they agreed upon and still do. So most of Western Christendom, uh, whether it's Protestant or Catholic or even Eastern European Orthodox has embraced that particular theology. But, but Egyptians and other Africans and, and also in Asia had a different Christology, uh, actually a couple of different Christologies, especially in Asia. But in Africa, for the most part, there was a different Christology and that was a part of their identity. It was so much a part of their identity that that was what first led them to split. And even centuries later, that was still kind of the main difference, even for Ethiopia, for example. In fact, even in the the actual name of the Ethiopian church is the Ethiopian Orthodox Tewahedo Church. And the word Tewahedo in Ethiopian languages, uh, Ge'ez or Amharic, it means one or it means united. And that goes, you know, the, the them saying one or united in their name, that harkens back all the way back to this split in 451, where again, the Ethiopian church and the Egyptian church was arguing that Jesus is one nature, that it's not two two natures. And so that just shows how much this theology, this Christology is at the core of their very identity. In fact, on the cover of the book, uh, the, the design on it of the little cross is actually from an Egyptian monastery. Uh, so it's from a picture I took and used it with permission from the monks in that monastery, Makari, that his humanity and his divinity, that they came into one. Uh, and so that's where they say that again, he, that Jesus is one, that he, he's fully human, he's fully divine, but that, that those are, those exist as one nature. Uh, and so that's, that's really, um, a big part of their identity. And even though that's not, um, that's not a big theological issue that those of us in the African-American church have really delved into or engaged in, uh, in any kind of real serious depth or certainly had any conflict over. I, I, I thought it was a really interesting dynamic. And I, and I do think that we can relate to doing church in a particular way, having a unique theology and worship style that is often marginalized or pushed to the side by the dominant, even dominant church uh, or the church of the dominant culture and, and how we will oftentimes have to carve out our own identity and our own theology that is oftentimes has to meet in secret or even uh, meet off to the side and, and work with whatever resources we have in a context of oppression. And that this was the issue that made the Egyptian church oppressed and marginalized by the dominant European church. Uh, and then in the same way in this country, the black church in America has had also had to struggle with being marginalized primarily by the white church, uh, uh, by people who are also uh, allegedly Christians and 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 how that also has been a part of identity. So I thought that that was a really helpful connecting point to to read a different theological context, but also a similar story in the sense of of African Christians who have to. Uh, really assert their identity in the face of oppression by people in the dominant culture who even themselves claim to be Christians. Wow. You know, um, uh, as I listen to you, you know, talk about that particular uh, area uh, one thing I wanted to ask you is how do, after you were speaking to some of the monks and at these different places, like where you went to uh, over there in Egypt, um, how did they feel about the research you were doing to gather this information, to kind of bring it back over here to this country to kind of, I don't want to say popularize it or, or highlight it or amplify, you know, some things that have been neglected or actually rejected, you know, by other uh, Western Christians. 
Yeah, yeah, that that's that's uh, been really empowering to when when I have had the chance to talk with monks and priests and and even patriarchs of different churches in, in Africa, Eritrea, Ethiopia, Egypt. Uh, that's been really encouraging because they they've often been very encouraging. They they've often been very excited to see because they. Uh, you know, a lot of times they have wanted to engage. And this is another, I think, connecting point uh, between African-Americans and, you know, uh, Africans who are the descendants of ancient Christianity in Africa is that uh, another connecting point is that in both contexts, the uh, in Egypt and in Ethiopia and Eritrea, and then also in among um, European missions was riding on the coattails of colonialism. And so but Africans haven't been able to as much because of issues of oppression. And so I've encountered people, monks and priests who have seemed excited when especially people of African descent, but any people, uh, but especially people of African descent learn about the history of of Christianity in Egypt, in Ethiopia, in Nubia, when we learned about this, because that was always the hope. And that was that was what was happening. Christianity was spreading across the continent. And and a lot of the reason why it didn't spread further was because of this issue that I go into in this book was because of the way that the church was, was split in the 400s. And then the European church was oppressing the African church and limiting its ability to spread the gospel in other parts of Africa. And so in today it's almost like we're getting an opportunity to come full circle. And there are there are even African Americans and and Afro-Caribbeans and other and other and e other people in other parts of the continent that have even converted into the Orthodox Church, the uh, Egyptian and e Ethiopian uh Eritrean Orthodox churches. Uh which, you know, I, I and I think, you know, that's not something I have felt called to do of the Lord, but uh I've met a lot of people of African descent who have done that. And and whether, you know, whether someone goes that far with it uh, to where they're converting and coming under uh, the, you know, the African Orthodox churches or like myself, if they are, you know, still just a Christian without, you know, any particular denomination, uh, but they but they have a respect and a regard for uh, and a desire to study the ancient history and to highlight it. Um, uh, that's often been even when again, when I was doing this book and I asked the monks in Egypt for the permission to put their crosses on my book, they they were very excited. Uh, and they said, yeah, please do that. Uh, because it's just a way of, of, you know, even if I'm not part of the Coptic Orthodox Church, it's a way of promoting it. And, and uh, you know, for example, even in my school, we call it the Meacham School of Hymeno, which is an Ethiopian is word for theology or faith. And again, we're not part of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, but, but these are different ways that we can still uh, give a shout out to our ancestry and you know, uh, you know white christians do that all the time they uh even if they're not catholic or even anglican they still use latin terms sometimes or they'll still use architectural or other you know kind of uh homages even if they're presbyterian or lutheran or or uh, baptist or whatever they'll kind of throw these little homages back to their ancient uh european medieval european or greco-roman even uh past and and i think that as black christians whatever our denomination is i think that there's a way we can do that as well mm. you you know i want to ask you I, I mean i don't know how long did it take you to get this completed and what were some of the biggest challenges you faced in doing this project yeah this that's a great question too this this project in particular um definitely brought up some unique challenges uh and i'll, I'll say why at at the first is that you know i will say that honestly um the biggest reason why i felt called of the lord to write this particular book is actually out of a uh really a missional strategy and uh this actually goes back to your other question too about how it relates to the other books and all that well if for those who have had a chance to see gospel hymeno or even the the hymeno journal uh and even the meacham school of hymeno Part of our mission uh, is, and we we feel ourselves called as missionaries, as black scholars of theology and the Bible, but who are also biblical, who also still uh, hold very strongly to the universal truth of the bisrot of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That we're actually unique in that regard. In that, in gospel, how many we go into the fact that actually most. Um, academic scholars of religion and theology that are black 
actually don't believe in the authority of scripture. Uh, and, and I always try to share this because many people in the black church and black community are not aware of this. And I think it's important that we are aware. Now I'll say this, that it's important that we love everybody. In fact, some of these scholars are my friends and they're, you know, I, I go out to lunch with and coffee with them. And these are my friends and I love them. They're my neighbor. They're my fellow image bearers. So I don't say this to incite any kind of acts of hatred or, or gossiping or, or anything like that. But I also think that as believers, it's important that we are, uh, aware, uh, made aware of heretical teaching. And and again, I think it's important that we have that balance of love, but also truth. And again, most most people in the black church and black community are not even aware that the majority of black people with PhDs in the Bible or in theology don't actually believe that Jesus is the only way, truth and the life. Don't actually believe that the Bible is God's perfect inspired word. And that's a big disconnect because most black people in the in the pulpit or in the pews would affirm those things and would say absolutely that Jesus is Lord, that he's the only way to life. So, so there's a big disconnect between the black church or, or Ivy leagues or dip schools and whatever. And so, um, and so that's why, that's why most, you know, I would say probably nine out of 10 of black scholars who have a PhD in religion and theology don't espouse, you know, biblical orthodoxy. And so, and so that's why the Meacham School of Hymenot exists, because even the black seminaries that are around, they all also, not some, but all of the black seminaries, the black accredited graduate level divinity schools or schools of theology. I mean, it's not that many. It's only by like eight or nine or something like that. Uh, and all of them teach from that same liberal standpoint because all of their deans and professors got their PhDs from white liberal schools. And again, there's a big disconnect and people don't even know why. And another reason a lot of people in the black church are not aware of that is because a lot of times these same scholars will uh, hide their theological views because they want to be able to play both sides. They want to be able to teach in the liberal classrooms that they work in, but they still want to be able to have a foot in the black church and still preach in the black church. And so a lot of times they'll hide their views or they'll kind of dance around it uh, or sometimes they'll just outright lie. Uh, and so that's another reason why it's important to shine this light on it. But also the Meacham School of Hymn Note exists so that we can produce more uh, biblical scholars, uh, pastors and ministry leaders, but also scholars uh, at the master's and doctoral level who are black and proud and who are liberative in their theology but who are also biblical in their theology. And that's what we call being gospelist, having a gospelist pr framework, which is one that is Afrocentric, that is unapologetically black and pro-justice, and also is one that is biblical and stands on the authority of the word of God. And, and so, uh, and so, you know, as we are, as we have continued to try to, through our conference and our journal, and even the book Gospel Hymenot tried to promote that, um, we, you know, uh, the Lord really, uh, made, really kind of pulled on me because, and actually I just got back. I was just in Texas last week, uh, in San Antonio where we had uh, the Society of Biblical Literature or the American Academy of Religion. This is the largest, uh, theology conference in the world. And, and this is actually where most black scholars will come to. Uh, it's a predominantly white gathering because it's, you know, thousands of scholars, but most black scholars, that's where they'll go to. And it was, I was reminded again of how there's so few of us that are black scholars who are still biblical and, and I and a, a few years ago, before I did this book, I, I became convicted that there really needs to be uh, we, we need to have a voice as well in their space. Uh, because I'll, I'll tell you that my uh, my book, Multitude of All Peoples or Gospel Hymenote or other books that have been done by the view, the few of us, right, the 10 percent of us that are black scholars who are still biblical. Um, we most of our works are being published in Christian publishers and usually white evangelical publishers, you know, like Baker, Zondervan, University Press, like my book, which is great. Uh, and that's even why I strategically did Gospel Hymenote in a black press and a black publisher. But the black scholars who are predominantly liberal, they mainly do most of their publishing in university presses and in the academic world there is a i think silly but real hierarchy of press or oxford university press or uh or you know uh pennsylvania university press or whatever the case may be and that's you and in scholarly world university presses are seen as more prestigious and so now the irony is that that's actually using a white <laughs> system of hierarchy so these black scholars are talking about we're going to be you know uh liberative and anti-colonial but you're actually using the same colonial system of hierarchy uh you know but i'm like okay fine let me let me play the game a little bit with y'all so 
honestly, that was the reason why I did this book. It's actually not even so much the content of the book, but it's the book itself and what it symbolizes as a black scholar who is openly Christian. Everybody who knows me knows that I'm a Christian and I don't hide it. I don't dance around it, nothing like that. And to yet still publish with a university press because th my book, as far as I can see, I I'm not sure. I, I could be wrong. I actually hope I'm wrong. Uh, somebody let me know if I'm incorrect about this. But I think that this book that I just did might be the first black like book done by a black scholar of religion theology who is openly their their literature and he was quoting their poets back to them when he was preaching the gospel to them and even using their religious imagery to preach the gospel and that's what we sometimes have to do so honestly that was the reason why i did this book was to legitimize in their eyes not my not in my not that i felt i needed that legitimacy but in these people who to whom i feel called as a missionary uh to really share the gospel with uh to show that that, well, okay, our scholarship is respectable as well in the way you esteem it, and and in a way to build that bridge is that's really kind of the what led to it. Wow, isn't that something when you have to fight other cultures or other ethnicities, and then you have your own that aren't even working with you to say, well, maybe I don't believe as they do, but there's still respect you know, the scholarship and the work and with the degrees and things that you have, I mean, I, I can't even imagine, you know, uh, how they could even take that stand. And, and that was one of the questions I was going to ask you, but you answered it about some of the pushback from some of your colleagues, you know, about you, you know, why even bother doing all this work, you know, uh, that hadn't been done here before, but it, you actually answered it. And that is such a great, uh, you know, uh, reasoning. And I was going to ask you um, for some of the, the, the research journey for you when you put together the book, what would this one in particular, because as I said, I'm holding this book. And even though it, it's 200 and some odd, 300 pages um, in total, it doesn't even, I mean, it represents so much. We read this and we see this information, but everybody doesn't know what you had to go through to gather this information, to put it in, in a binder like this so that we could read it. But I mean, this was a real journey and a process for you. And, you know, having said that, I want to just take a minute, uh, viewers, don't go away. I want to share with you some of the uh, research journey, you know, uh, in picture and video that you can see that uh, Dr. Bantu actually um sacrificially put forward to bring this to us. And we'll be right back. Please don't go away. I want you to really see this and uh, kind of get a feel for the experience of what he uh, actually put into it. So we'll be right back. Don't go away.
Hi, well, I know you all really uh, appreciated seeing, you know, some of the research journey that Dr. Bantu put into it, because as you read this book and you see it, you have no idea, you know, just reading it and seeing it. And Dr. Bantu, you traveled um, with your family and it was so good to see, you know, your wife and your children with you. What was that it like for you? That must have been incredible, I know, for them and you as well to be able to do some of this together. Yeah, it really was. Uh, you know, I, I, and actually, um, this is a shout out. If, if anybody can find it, I, I'm not even sure where to find it. But, you know, a long time ago, when when I first uh, when the Lord first really introduced me to this history is specifically in Egypt. Actually, it was, it was in Egypt. Really exciting. Um, but I did get a chance uh, to take my wife and kids to Ethiopia briefly uh, last summer in 22, as we were, you know, when we were in that same part of the world passing through. And so that's been that's been a huge blessing to be able for them to be able to see uh a lot of that a lot of that same history and and also um this is on a personal note not necessarily with the book but uh my wife and i are actually in the process of building our own home uh in here in st louis in our in our neighborhood in the hood <laughs> um but it's actually going to be a traditional african style of home and uh celebrating african designs and you know african architecture uh so yeah if everybody everybody's ever in st louis uh definitely look us up but i'll definitely post some pictures of it when it's done L likely in like uh, uh i think may is when we're shooting uh, for it to be done but the skeletal structures up and and we have but my wife and and I actually just had the opportunity in preparation for this, which is more, again, more on a personal, but it still overlaps with research uh, as well. Uh, just on uh, African academia now having gone through it, uh, there is a, it is it is a little bit at, a, at like a more rigorous level of scholarship than, you know, say in Christian publishing. Uh, and so that's now that's not to say at all um, or agree with this sentiment that, oh, you know, Christian scholarship is not real scholarship or Christian publishing is not real scholarship. That's not true at all. Um, but I will say that, at least in my experience in the university press world, it was a, a bit more rigorous and the, the the peer review process and all of that was a bit more rigorous. And so I, I just say that as a call for other, especially in the black community, but people in general, especially Christians to publish in those spaces as well, because I'm trying to exemplify what I really want us to do, which is to, you know, be a bridge. Like, you know, even in my first three books, you notice one of them is in a white Christian press. Mm -hmm. One of them is with a black Christian press. And one of them is with a white, you know, quote unquote, let's say secular or academic university press. And that's intentional because I want to have my voice in different places. And I think all of us as scholars need to do that, not just be in an echo chamber where we're writing with people who only agree with us, but also the black press is important too. And I know we've talked about this in our episode on gospel hymenote. Uh, it's so important. I think it's so important, especially that black scholars and authors, uh, whether you're academic or popular level or artist or preacher, whatever, it is so important for us to support black publishers and black presses because we have to support black owned institutions at every level, uh, schools, churches, but publishers also. Um, but I also wanted to write in university press and I will say it was more rigorous. And there were even, you know, uh, a couple of other university presses that I talked with that they just rejected it or it was, you know, they didn't work with me. Uh, and, and it was a lot more rigorous. So I give a shout out to university of California press, my editor there and, the people that I worked with there were a lot more empowering and but it was very rigorous. And and so uh, it really did help me think about and give me tools on how I can even when I'm writing in black owned presses or because I have other projects that I'm developing right now, also with Urban Ministries International and other black and African presses. But it helps give me the uh, the tools that I can use in these secular presses to bring that same level of writing into what I'm doing. And so I would encourage people to diversify their audience and to, you know, to be at different tables, but then bring those resources, uh, which oftentimes were gained in those quote unquote top level institutions. Oftentimes their resources were gained through colonialism and slavery. So go into those spaces, get the resource, but bring them back into our space and we can build up our own institutions, but to do it at a, at a higher level of quality. And so when I was able to go through that and hand it in uh, after a, a grueling editorial process, which was helpful, I would say uh, it helped it felt better um, in the sense that now, you know, I have gained skills that I can further bring into our circles at Meacham School of Hymenote or even our journal and, and other book projects that I'm working on with in, in our community. Uh, I, what was their thought on, you know, why you could they rejected? 
publishing, but well, yes, well, University yeah. Press did. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, nowadays people always have ways of kind of skirting around things and, you know, kind of are skillful with their words so that you, unless you really catch them <laughs> on tape, then they can always skirt out of something. Uh, I will say though that, again, shout out to my editors and publishers at University of California Press that even while in that space, there were issues I did need to work on that I that really helped this, the, the finished product become better, uh, even in many of their space and in other colleagues uh, heard from that this was definitely a project that other editors should have grabbed onto. Uh, I'll just say that that was their words. And so uh, and so, I, you know, and I think there's two factors. I think one is many of these university presses don't uh, what you know again, whether even and this is something that black scholars have to deal with, regardless of whether it's a Christian press or if it's a university of all colors have to deal with in secular academia. But when you're black and Christian, openly Christian, it's a double, uh, you know, it's a double problem. And so, I think that was another reason why I was having trouble. And I think I would say it's spiritual warfare also, because again, what we're trying to do is to show that you can be black and Afrocentric, and you can be Christian uh, and at the same time. You don't have to pick. And that's when you do both of those, you're, you, you lose, uh, you lose supporters in white Christian circles because they want to be super conservative and all that. And then you can lose supporters in the secular world as well, because they're not down with, they're all about black, you know, lives matter or whatever else the case may be, but they're not about, you know, people sharing their, their Christian faith openly. And so it was really, I think a miracle that, 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 that happened. And it was really the work of God because it really is, it is it really spiritual warfare that we're waging with principalities. Uh, and so, um, um, yeah, so it was, it was, uh, you know, I think that was, an, but I think both of those factors were what led to, you know, a lot of the challenges that, that I had getting this out here. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for that. I mean, it's just been wonderful having you here as always, and you always bring something new and something so monumental, uh, uh, and, and, and helpful to the body of Christ and to pastors. So before we close out, I always ask you, would you close out with prayer, but is there anything you want to say to any uh, pastor, leader, or any of the viewers before we close out? Yeah, I, I, I would just say, and I'd be happy to close in prayer. And I think maybe just in line with, uh, again, what we've been talking about in this new book, and even what led me to 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 do it, I would just encourage folks based, you know, based on my experience with this book, I would encourage folks uh, who, you know, especially, uh, I mean, you know, really, you know, for me, for anybody, but especially folks who are, who are black and who are Christian, who, who wave the blood, same banner of Christ, I would encourage you to get out into these, uh, into these, these realms, right? Where n either of those perspectives are not always welcome or, or seen or very visible, especially, you know, in academic theological circles and whether that's in schools, universities, divinity schools, or whether it's with publishing houses or conferences or these spaces, uh, where, where again, uh, the, the experience of black people and the perspective of, of Bible believing, born again, saved Christians is not very welcome or present. I would encourage you to get out there and make, you know, let your light shine and go into these places, uh, and, and really go into the world. Like instead of always just like, sometimes it's easier to just stay in our huddle where we're, and that's cool. I'm with that because we need that, honestly, to be encouraged. But then I would say, but to go out into these spaces and, and be black and proud, uh, unapologetically and be Christian and saved and all about Jesus unapologetically. Uh, and I would just, you know, encourage and, and maybe even in that, to that point and, and in, maybe I can even just kind of pray us out, uh, Amen. if that's okay. Amen. Yes. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you, viewers. Pray along with us. Thank you. Okay, okay. Thank you. Well, Father God, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you, Lord, that you are on the throne. And we thank you, Lord, uh, just for the ways in which you have been working in ways that we can't even begin to fathom and that we just get to be a part of what you are doing for your kingdom. I thank you for Sister Beverly. I thank you for the well. Thank you for this space that she has created for uh, for the body of Christ, Lord, and to uplift the name of Jesus. And we just thank you, Lord, for uh, especially the ways that she is building up all of your people and especially your people of African descent uh, in this community. And, and we just uh, pray blessings on this ministry. We thank you, Lord, for this book that uh, that you have allowed to be 
And we just ask, Lord, that it would be giving you glory and you would use it for your kingdom uh, in the academic world, in the church world, in the in the in the black spaces and the white spaces and uh, anywhere else, Lord, that you see fit. Would you just bring glory to yourself and to your name? And we do pray, Lord, for those of us in the body of Christ, especially those of us of African descent, that you would help us, Lord, to uh, be able to show the world that we can be proud of who we are and that we can love Jesus. And those, those two things are not in conflict, Lord. Um, and, and that you showed us that Lord God, as you took the body of a Hebrew, a Jewish man, Lord, and you were, you love your people and yet you also love the world and, and you bring glory to yourself, Lord, and your house is a house of prayer for all nations. And so we just thank you, Lord, for giving us that example and help us to walk in that example. And we pray, especially Lord, for the growth of more and and more black theology and black biblical studies that is black and proud unapologetically and also is Christocentric and glorifies the name of Jesus. And we pray that the well and the Meacham School of Hymeno and this book in particular and all the things we put our hands to would be uh, just be able to be a part of that mission of your mission. And we uh, just thank you that we get to be a part of it. And we're very careful to give you all the honor, glory, and praise in the name of Jesus and to whose glory that we commit all the labors of our hands and that we commit this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much again, Dr. Bantu. I can't thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>